some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and today I'm doing a discussion over Iki and the expansion. Iki Akebono is uh, how I'm probably going to mispronounce that. Um, Iki is actually a game that I have had on my shelf for many, many years. Like, uh, I got it at Gen Con on a whim one year. I think it was, it was like three years ago. And it got the expansion uh, for no reason, because I was like, oh, I've heard Iki is super good without ever having played it. And I'm like, oh, I'll get the expansion while I'm at it. Um, but what I knew about it was that it was kind of a uh, Rondell-style worker placement game. Um, and I'm like, I'm sold. And I love the, the Feudal Japan era, the Edo period, which ranged from a lot longer than I thought. And that was pretty much it. But... Whenever there's games that I have on my shelf for so long, I'm always kind of hesitant to play them because then it's like, oh god, like, I really hope it's worth all the effort of just having it. And I'm proud to say that Iki is an excellent game. I'll get to the expansion in a, in a sec, but the base game of Iki is, which I think that's how it's pronounced as well, is phenomenal. It is such a solid solid worker placement game and this is a genre that i'm kind of getting in that well i have the ones that i have that i really like i don't really need to add any more but Iki is definitely going into the collection because it's relatively unique and it's super fast paced very quick like you only have 12 actions uh like 12 turns in the entire game and a 13th turn that kind of lets you do whatever you want but it's placed over uh, 12 rounds, each round being a month of the year, and each, uh, and each after every three years, three months, you end the season. So it does your four seasons that really just kind of correspond into kind of the, the cards that are coming out. But the fact that you only really get one worker and your turn order is based off of where you place your, I'm not even going to try to pronounce what these workers are, but you place your worker on a spot that dictates how many spaces your main guy gets to go around the market. And depending on where he lands are the shops that he gets to go to. So you are hiring characters to place in these market stalls that if anyone uses them, you have little worker guys that gain an experience for that. And they're gonna give you variable actions that give you resources, to uh, either move more or pay your upkeep of rice or give you resources to build buildings. Um, all while you're kind of creating a little engine of set collection because you want these people to retire. It kind of has like an Elysium Evenfall feel where you have your workers out for so long before to use their abilities, but eventually they're going to retire and they're going to come to your board. But what's cool about that is it's not like they go away and it's like, well, I guess they'll score me points. Um, they still will give you benefits each time that a season ends. You get the income of all your retired workers and your workers that are out on the board. So you kind of just get an influx of stuff. And this game just feels good the entire time while being tight, but also not too tight. Like, if you have a... I mean, you can only ever have a max of four workers out, like four people running stalls, meaning that if they're not retired by the end of a season, then you only need four rice. So it's not like this constant upkeep. And what's also great about that is that when a season ends everyone gives you their resources first. So you might have a person where it's like, oh crap, I only have three rice. Oh wait, this person that's retired gives me a rice. So now I have my four to pay for the four people out there. And I love that. I love how it's like, get your stuff first and then pay the cost of things. Um, and then if you build buildings, well, that actually takes away one of your soul workers to run the building, so they're actually out for the rest of the game, but those are giving you a bunch of endgame victory points. Just like one of them, this, uh, this shrine gives you 22 points at the end of the game. But, and, and that's that. One of them, this, uh, this Kabuki Tower, uh, Kabuki Theater, gives you 26 points. So, and the difference of four points is a wood, but... 
you're not ever really in an influx of wood. You never really have a ton of money, a ton of rice, but you have enough. And if you want a ton of that stuff, you have ways to go out and get it. Because at the beginning of your turn, you can either choose to get four money, just an income of four money, uh, or hire a character that is out in the market to place them. But you can't do that if you don't have workers available. This game is just so smooth. And what's also interesting is you know everything that is coming up the entire time. You can see, okay, I only have three turns, so if I want to, you know, build a building this this month or this season, then here are the actions that I'm going to have to take. But what's also interesting is you have uh, this kind of turn order bidding. Um, not really bidding, but kind of like turn order does matter in this game, but it's not super... Um, like super cutthroat. Like there are ways where it's like, okay, I need to move exactly three spaces. So uh, like this spot here is three. Oh, okay, purple went there first. All right, well, I'm gonna go to two because you have these sandal tokens that increase your movement. But what's also interesting is movement is the movement you have to move. So it's not like up to three, it's three. So you're moving three spaces. And if you need to move four, but someone, or if you need to move three, but someone took the three, you can go to the two spot, but it's going to cost you a sandal. If you don't keep sandals around, then you're kind of at the whim of turn order, but there's ways for you to manage that, which is tied into the firefighting track. And I'll get to the firefighting track in a sec, because it's weird. I think it's the only, it's like a very weird thing about, about this game, but the... Very interesting part is also in a two-player game, in the base game, because the expansion changes the two-player rules. In the base game, you just have these 12 tokens. At the beginning of the round, you just flip one of these over, and that blocks one of the one of the spots, so you can't go there. Um, I actually really like that in a two-player game, because a lot of games, it's like you have a dummy character, or, you know, it manages, it, like, you know, takes cards and stuff. It doesn't do that. It's literally like, hey, you just can't go to the one spot this month. Um, there's just so many ways to go about this game. So many ways to either go for a bunch of victory points during the game or a bunch of end game victory points, which is my favorite style of Euro game, where it's like, hmm, do I want to play for the short term or the long term? Do I really want to go for like not many points during the game, but I'm really going to rack up a bunch of points at the end? That's a viable strategy either way. And there's tons of ways to actually uh, go about either one of those. Like, again, buildings are great endgame victory points. Some characters, when they retire, allow you to get a bunch of victory points each time. Like, this one right here, if you can get them to retire in, um, like, retire in uh, spring, then, or in this case, he comes out in, um, in fall. But it's like okay, like, he's worth five points, but some of them, like this one, he's a winter character, but if he retires, he's going to give you nine points. So you could really just have a bunch of retired characters all giving you victory points, and each time that that season ends, they just give you an influx of points. Um, it's just, the game makes you feel good the entire time, and it makes you think, like, okay, if I want to do this, then I need to move that many spaces because each of these stalls has an action that you can take, but then you can do that action and the action of a worker uh, that is in front of that particular spot. So it's like, okay, ooh, I'm going to hire this character, put him in this spot because then I get to pick first on how many spaces I'm moving, and if I move two spaces, then that's going to let me go there, use him as a worker, uh, use his, uh, you know, character ability, which will then allow me to use the market ability. It's, there's just so many of that kind of combos going off without it being overly complex. The one thing about this game is for some reason, this game feels more complex than it is. Like, I don't know what it is about that rule book, but I don't think it's a bad rule book. It just is weirdly structured, I think, to where it's like, okay, wait a minute, so how do like because i mean it, it makes sense like one of the things that kept hanging me up was oh when you hire a character does it get replenished and nothing in the rule says it doesn't but 
in the paragraph for the characters, it says at the beginning of each month, put out four characters. And it's like, right, I did that. But I kept thinking it was seasons, not month. So I was like, oh, four characters come in in addition to the ones that are already there. And the ones that were already there get a coin on them that basically make them cheaper to hire, which makes them easier to come out, which means you have more people working, uh, more places for people to use. The one thing that's really cool is like, it has that double-edged sword of, okay, I want to go here to use that ability, but that's someone else's worker, which means he's going to gain experience and he'll retire. It's like, okay, do I, do I really want to give him that retire ability or do I want to allow them to use the, the action on it? It's like, but I also really need to use that action. So it has a lot of that type of, of thinking where you're almost always gaining something. Sometimes you might hire a character because you don't really need its ability, but you know what it, you know someone else does, but its income, like its experience income is really good. Like this guy, this Kabuki uh, actor is just going here and visiting him, gives you three points. But every time he gains XP, it's like six points, seven points, nine points. So you're giving someone else pretty much more points um, for you to get more points or for you to get some points. It's, it just is so, so fascinating. Um, now, the one thing about it that I find extremely weird, and I can't really figure out why it's in here, thematically, I mean, unless thematically, it, this happened all the time, it, it just feels so disjoint. I think it's because they use the term firefighting. So, it's this fire track. So, this fire track is basically dual purpose. It is turn order so it, whoever is highest on the firefighting track is the one who gets to place their uh, their hat guy on the movement track uh, they get to place first that doesn't mean they're going to move first it just means they get first dibs at the, at the number of spaces they want to move because uh, if i go to if i get a place first and i go on four well if someone goes to two they're going to go before me um but not only that, but on uh, months 5, 8, and 11, at the end of those months, a fire breaks out. And so you want to increase your fire track because these fires have a strength to them. And the person who is like at the top shuffles these four tokens and draws one. And this will determine which market stall the fire breaks out at. And it kind of just hits the stall and then goes down, decreasing in its strength. So let's say in a two-player game, we're on month eight and the strength is seven. It's like, okay, blue's drawn and it hits that first spot. Is there something there? If there is, whoever owns it, in this case, in this final game, it was a building. Purple's building is there. Do, does their firefighting strength equal or exceed the um, the the fire strength, which is seven. In this case, no. Building just burns down, which sucks a huge amount because that costs a lot of resources and a lot of time, but it's just gone. So that can happen. And then it moves on. It goes to the next spot, decreasing in strength. Is there anything there? No, moves on, decreases. In, it basically goes down, decreasing in strength a certain amount um, until someone's strength uh, equals that to stop it or it just burns the entire market and then hits like the street. It doesn't like carry over to all the stalls and then the whole place is on fire. It's like, okay, hits the street, fizzles out. So people's characters who were there, if they weren't retired, uh, they, they just die. They die in a fucking market fire. Buildings burn down. And, but what's interesting is it's like, if I place my spot on the first, you know, the first spot where like, okay, the fire is gonna hit there first, but my strength is equal, then anyone else behind me is safe. Because let's say my strength was seven in that, and you know the blue player had their building out, well then it's gonna hit that first spot, and then, well my strength is seven, the fire strength is seven, I put it out, it, the, the fire's out, so then everyone else is good. It's not a bad mechanism, I really feel like it was mainly there um, just to clear up the board uh more so than anything because 
unless people are using your characters. Now, each time you do like a full lap around the market track, all your characters' um, experience goes up. So eventually, if you're lapping a bunch of times, then all your people will eventually retire. But there's nothing stopping you from going one space at a time. So I feel like the fire was there to kind of aid in clearing up the board so that people could um, have more room to build buildings and to put characters. By any means, it is not a bad mechanism. It's just kind of thematically weird. It's like, okay, when I think of, uh, you know, Edo and the market, you know, industry, I don't think of fires breaking out all the time, but maybe they do. Maybe they did. I think it's just weird because they, they use... Japanese terminology for literally for the workers for like for the these guys for the for the the turn order meeple for the guy who's they use all I'm assuming correct terms but then they throw in firefighters it's like maybe it's a theme thing for me where it's like when I think of firefighters I think of modern day firefighters it, it would just it's like what's why don't you just use the Japanese term for firefighting uh I don't know I mean again it, it, it's a turn order thing, so that also aids in that. Um, there's ways to score victory points from it, so it is a prominent aspect. It doesn't feel like it's just this weird thing that they threw into the game for no reason. It's just kind of like, ah, okay, something to keep in mind. And I, I, because there's incentive in a multiplayer game to kind of be on the very end, because you want these corner spots, because they score basically double uh, during a certain period of the game, but it costs a little bit more to place there. But you're also the safest. So it's like, I, I kind of wish that it's like, okay, well, you're, you're, it, you're getting a ton of benefit for really no extra reward. Um, sorry, for really no extra cost. Like, it's like, yeah, it costs a couple more coins to be able to place your, your card there, but now you're getting a bunch of victory points for it, and... If someone else is putting cards in front of it, which they are now because you took that spot, well, chances are they might have a higher firefighting score than you, so they're basically protecting your stuff. Um, I would have liked it if, like, hey, you're in the corner, that's where the fire starts, but you're also running, it's a risk-reward thing. That's I would have enjoyed that more versus, well, I'm pretty much safe in this corner spot, so, yeah, do, hey, guys, you deal with the fire. Um, now, if the players are running the risk of never increasing their fire because they're banking on other people to do it, people could just not place characters there, or they could try and amp and retire them, um, and then that person just loses their stuff, but it's like they probably would have reaped rewards off that anyway. Uh, so yeah, so the fire is just kind of odd, but it is there, and it only happens three times in the game, and you know exactly what the strength of the fire is going to be before it happens. So it's not like this random event that's just like, oh, great, and a fire happens to break out, and I couldn't plan for it. Nope, you can very much see what the score is going to be. You can ramp up your fire track way early and never have to deal with it. It's completely up to you. So other than that, I really don't have many, like, I, I don't really have any negatives on the game. It's just extremely clean, um... And the two-player, I thought, worked out really, really well. Like, this game has a really good, I think, uh, play uh, like play experience for any number of players. Because even if you have four people, your turn is literally, okay, I place my guy, I'm going to, I'm moving three spaces, I'm choosing to take four money, and I'm going to move my three spaces, and I'm going to do those two actions real quick. Like, this game is also set collection, where each, at the end of each season, each market um, will score. So it's kind of like, it, it wants the same type of uh, worker, so basically the same color, and you score based on how many of your own workers are there, or just workers in general. So let's say there are three purples in this stall here. If there's a person on each one, let's say I had, had one on each one it would be three purple times the three workers there. So I'd get nine points for that. Now let's say it was someone else's worker. So I would get six points and then the other color would get three points because they have one worker times the three. So the stalls want like, um, 
like jobs. Like they want the same jobs there. And but each of each of those jobs kind of do a similar thing. So it's like, well, how much are you gonna try and combo with different different uh, craftsmanship and the market abilities? So you're not always gonna be going for that. But some like for example, this building here, this public bathhouse, doubles your points for each of those types of scoring. So it's like, okay, I have three purples here. I have this building built somewhere. This is a permanent passive ability. That's gonna be nine points for me. Well, because of this building, it's now 18 points. So you can really try and go for that type of scoring. And in a multiplayer game, those corners kind of all check each other as well and kind of does the same thing. So it is a very interesting element of scoring, but yeah, like, it's just super, super clean. Like, I, I'm i pleasantly surprised. So with that, Iki, the base game, is going to get, I think it's gonna get a nine from me. I, I really, really like it. Like, it is a fantastic game. So then we move on to Iki Akebono, which, is an amazing expansion as well. Like they, they, this is a solid expansion for this. So it's not modular, which is my favorite type of expansion. But if you're not doing that, then this is a solid way of throwing in just enough more content, but without increasing the complexity of the game. Now it does tweak things that make the game um, a little bit weird, at least in my, my opinion, not bad, but it's like, oh, that's different. So one, it basically adds an organizer board. So there's two new boards that are added. It adds one that kind of has a new flow of, um, so instead of just having the character cards off to the side, now there's a board specifically for that. So it has a spot for the buildings and a spot for the deck. And now instead of just shuffling all the season cards and just having them out, you actually create one deck. You remove two cards from each season and then just shuffle those and stack them so that you'll go through the entire deck throughout the course of the game. It adds characters. So now each month has a specific character that gets added. And there are a number of these and you basically, I think there's four of each number. And you just shuffle those four and pick one. And then you do that for each month. So you'll have 12 cards and that's a new character to, that you can potentially hire. Um, and it adds the boat section, so the river dock, uh, the, oh man, I don't remember, the Nihonbashi Bridge um, that introduces a new, a new track and new permanent uh, powers and kind of extends the, the lanes, like the Rondell area. And everything that this game added is fantastic. Uh, even again, the two-player variant gets updated um, without making anything more complex. So let's talk about each one of these new things, the characters, um, and kind of like the way that they modified the way the characters come out. So now each of these characters now kind of gives you a hiring like bonus. So like this girl, she, uh, the calendar seller, she costs three, but she gives you sandals. Um, this doctor, uh, is four, it moves you up on the fire track, but they also added a few new tokens. So the doctor, for example, if he retires, gives you a token that's like, hey, if anyone is to die or like from fire, or if you can't pay their rice, you can actually discard this to prevent them and retire them instead. So just a, a unique character. They're not overly complex or anything. They just get added and it's something new to just look at when you're hiring. But now four characters come out like normal but now there's actually like a rotation system so normally from my understanding in the base game it was just add four characters at the beginning of each month anyone who was left over previously gets money now with the expansion two characters move over and only those two characters get money and then the rest get discarded so you're pretty much only going to have two left over and then they're going to be one cheaper because the two people that were left over from the previous month if they're still there, they just get discarded and then you cycle them out. Now this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, I felt that with the expansion, you didn't have as many people retiring and you didn't have as many people being hired. Because in the base game, if no one was getting hired, eventually they were just gonna be free. 
uh, until they went away at the end of the season. So it's like having things get consistently cheaper is nicer because only having one coin on them, it's like, well, some of these cost six or seven, you know, maybe one costs one and it's free or a couple things. But I felt that money was a bigger issue with the expansion added without really making anything else a bigger issue because it's like your money didn't go quite as far because hiring characters which gave you potentially more money or more resources now cost you more so i felt that i was constantly just taking the four money instead of hiring a character um not that that's necessarily a bad thing but it did feel like it feel it did feel like that that part wasn't as interesting i wasn't really looking at the characters as much because it's like well i have no money anyway so i can't really hire them so it doesn't really matter what, who's out there. And that kind of translated to the new characters. It's like, well, I'd like to hire you, but I don't have any money. So, and it could have just been the way that the cards were coming out. I just didn't have a money engine. That could have easily been it. But I feel like cycling out the cards that are now just one cheaper is, it's like, well, that that's it. Like, that, you just, that they're just gone. Then two more come over, and now they're one cheaper. Um, so that, that's pretty much that. The characters that are getting added are neat. They're another option. Um, so you have a total of seven characters to choose from instead of however many. If no one buys characters at the beginning, you know, then four more come out, then you just have a bunch of characters lying around, but some of them are cheaper. And typically, like, you're not really just going to always take the four money because you need the characters to be able to do what the game is wanting you to do. The set collection of different types as well as just straight up income and extra action. So you're kind of alternating back and forth. Um, but that was nice. I like the extra board. The one thing that does kind of suck is it, <laughs> they have the, the art on the extra board to where you have to kind of like overlap the other board. It's just kind of weird um, like that. It almost feels like it wants it to be flush, but it can't, the art doesn't line up because the edge of the board has this white border around it. So it's like, well, the art doesn't line up, so it has to overlap, but that doesn't really work with the river portion over here. So that's just kind of annoying, like, to just, from a from an art perspective. But that's, that's fine, like, the way I like that it's still organized. Then we go over to the bridge portion, and this is obviously where most of the, most of the, the expansion comes from. So... It adds a new track, so you have a trade track similar to your fire track in that the higher up on the trade track you are, after every fire you get resources, So and they're cumulative. So if you're on the fifth track, at the end of every fire you'll get sandals and a money. If you're all the way up at 10, at the end of every fire you'll get 5 points, a koban, which these are used to build buildings typically. Uh, a rice, sandals, and a money. So going up on that track is very helpful. And you go up on that track by various resources or various actions, as well as people using boats. So there are six boats out on the out on the board. Um, one of uh, five of them are double sided, and so they have different actions on them. And when you do a build action, instead of doing building a building, you can build a boat. And you can only ever build two boats because you have two sailor meeples. But you kind of just run those boats and they can give you variable actions. Because now the little market circular area is increased by one spot. So if you land there, you can either meet a personality, which I'll explain the personalities, or activate a boat. And if you activate a boat, you just do its ability, and the owner of that spot goes up on the trade track. It is very simple, very excellent. Like the two in this last game I got was I could sell a pipe um, for a Koban, and then I could sell a Koban for eight victory points. So my strategy was to cycle and activate those boats a lot. Buy pipes, sell for eight points. Um, I only got to do that once because I was not moving as much as I planned, nor activating boats as it takes. It's like I had to go buy the pipe, go all the way around to be able to get to that spot to sell it, then go all the way around to sell the Koban for eight points. Um, I needed characters that basically let me activate boats, and I just never, never hired them. So that was a flaw in my plan. But 
It also increases the number of options you have because in the base game there were two fish, two pipes, and two, two tobacco. The expansion adds one of each of those. So now there are still two fish, two pipes, and two tobacco on the main board, but now there is a shop boat that if it is built, that third one of each goes over there. And whoever, so basically you now have more options of those to buy, but you're going to give someone a benefit of whoever owns the shop boat is going to go up on that track. But I really like the boat element. It's just extra actions, uh, really cool uh, abilities to do, and I love the extra track. The trade track is a very nice, just kind of like compensation for the fire, I guess. If you go up high enough, like if you can at least get to eight, getting a Koban is huge, because one, that's three points at the end of the game if you don't end up using it, but there's tons of ways to use it. Um, and then they also have these personalities. So these personalities here are, there's quite a few of them in the game, and there's one for each uh, each season. Well, there's two uh, available for each season, and you just take two of them and put them out there. But these give you, and they're free to take, Like, and they also in the rule book have like a paragraph of history on them, which is awesome. But like, like you can just get them, go and meet them. Like I can go meet uh, Takunai Mogami, and every time my character does a lap around the track, I get a sandal. And these are just there for you to take. Like you can, if you land there, you can meet the personality and activate a boat or one of each in any order. Um, this Kokan Shiba, he, if you have a pipe, tobacco, a fish, and a boat, then he just gives you seven points at the end of the game. This one, uh, Tadataka Ino, uh, if you have eight retired characters, five points. So just extra passive abilities that, I mean, they're not like insane, but just something, I mean, if you can get them for free, I wouldn't expect them to be broken. But there's only two available throughout the game or throughout each season. And if you go there, you can just be like, oh, okay, cool. Like one girl, she just lets you retire a character. So that could be huge if you can get, if you're trying to score these nine points from the uh, Kabuki actor, you can just go grab her, retire him immediately, and that could give you your purple you've been missing. So there's enough variety from those personalities and from the character cards that it gives you like a different uh, ex like extra layer during the game without overly complicating the actual core of the game. So it is, I think this is an excellent, excellent expansion. Um, I would have just wished that they they redesigned the whole board. That would have been very nice, just to have a long board. I mean, this could like this game could have a very stellar player mat. I think, like a dual sided player mat that gives you uh, the two two player side and the three or four player side with the expansion. That would look that would look very clean. But I like the boat elements. I like the fact that um, only you can only have so many boats. And again, kind of like with the, the characters in the stalls, if you want to use someone's boat, it's like, man, is that worth them going up that track? Oh man, he has that, he has that building that gives him two points for each spot he's up on the track. Ooh, do I want to use it to give him two points at the end of the game? Like it just has a lot of that decision-making. Um, yeah, so the expansion is, is awesome. And the two player variant it, like in the base game, it was just those. Now there's this Grandmaster Meeple that he kind of goes in the opposite direction of the players, but whenever he lands at a market stall, he increases the experience of a worker there. So he kind of aids in that retirement element, where is in a regular two-player game, you're not going to hit all that much. Like, you kind of are waiting to do your lap to increase your experience. He kind of, and he's super simple to run too. He basically moves... How many spaces he moves is equal to the, the block token. So in this case, oh, it was a one, so he's just gonna go one in the opposite direction. And uh, there was a there was a blue one here, so just move that up, and that's it. Doesn't overly complicate anything, just has someone who's trying to ramp up XP, or if he lands at the river board, then everyone who owns the boat there goes up one track uh, on the trade track. So that, that's pretty much it. This expansion is is fantastic. Like I, I 
was able, whenever I was learning it, it took me like two seconds to just be like, oh, okay, that's what's added. The tokens, the new tokens it adds, like it doesn't add any new characters, like actual to the game, but I actually do not mind that. I actually like the addition of just one new card per month instead of, you know, a whole new set of cards where it just bloats it because I think having that refined deck is what keeps this game clean. Like, if you bloated it, it's like, well, I'm looking for the... Where's the guy that lets me turn in rice for points? Oh, well, he's not in here because I, you know, I just shuffle 14 new cards in there and then take some of them out. It was just like, all it does is take two out. So that gives you enough variation again without overly complicating this. And I feel like sometimes expansions get added to a game like this and it's like, ugh. This is an ordeal now to learn. I don't want to teach people this game. Because now I could teach this game with this expansion. And it would not really be any more overhead. Like, I would honestly probably just throw in this expansion whenever I'm playing with new players. Because it, it is that little of a headache to throw in. It's just like, yeah, the extra abilities of the boats are there. But, I mean... It's really not that much to to add, but it does give you enough. It, and what's great is it gives you enough extra things that it will divert your attention, where it's like, now you're gonna be trying to focus on certain things over here instead of what you would normally do in the base game. And that, to me, is uh, the quality of, a, of an excellent expansion. So the Iki Akebono expansion, um, God, it's gonna probably, I think it's gonna get a nine for me as well. Like, it is so good. Like, I almost thought about docking at a point just for the stupid board edges. Um, but that's really the problem of the the base game than the expansion. Although they did make the expansion with that in mind, so it's like, why, like, why'd you do that? But I really like the organization. The characters are enough. Um, makes money a little bit tighter, but I guess if you're getting four money at the beginning of every turn, you are like, it's not like you're not hiring characters. The boats with their special abilities are really cool. The personalities are really cool. Um, the trade track is is just a nice... Ex I mean, I love tracks in games. It's uh, it's just so much fun to just be like, I'm going to try and go up on that this entire game. See if I can... See how quickly I can get to track 10 before the first fire so I can really reap all those benefits. That would be... What if that's even possible? I don't know. But yeah, with both of these, uh, like I think this is actually a must-have expansion to this game. It is, like the base game is so good, but the expansion just adds a little bit more uh, complexity uh, that just kind of gives this game a little bit more legs. Like I can feel like if you played the Iki, the base game over and over and over, it would kind of get almost like tedious a little bit. But this, I think, adds in enough that you're going to get a different set of, of new characters, a different set of combinations of personalities with the combination of boats. Very awesome. So that is my thoughts on the Iki and the expansion Iki Akebono. Let me know what you think of the game in the comments below. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.